So everyone's joining us now. Thank you very much for coming over from the welcome session. I am Tony Edwards, probably a face that you recognize if you've been to uh, one of our events before. Joining me today is Peter from Exobiotics. Exobiotics? No, Exobotics. And, and Exobotics are an amazing company who are trying to make space exploration more accessible by lowering the barriers to entry which sounds like an immense task and one that Peter has promised to sum up in just eight minutes. He doesn't need the full 10 minutes. How amazing is that? Um, well, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'm Peter. Can you guys see slides correctly? Excellent. Um, well, I'm uh, Peter Christopher. I'm a co-founder, software embedded systems lead at Exobotics, which translates to, um, uh, yeah, I do all the tech stuff. Um, I'm also a PDRA at Cambridge University, and I'm a research fellow at Emmanuel College for my sins. And I'm going to apologize in advance for, I'm not very good at this whole presentation, Lark. Um, they don't let me out of the back room very often. Um, so I'm going to be quick to allow more time for questions, because then hopefully I can talk about tax things rather than um, a sort of general vision and stuff. Um, so shooting on. Um, but. I'm also presenting on today on behalf of the team. So uh, Nadim Gabani is our CEO. Uh, Shveta's our business person and Maxim's our tester, and then me, obviously. And the way that translates to it is uh, Nadim pays, um, Nadim plans stuff, uh, Shveta pays for it, Maxim breaks it, and I make it work again. At least that's the idea. I like to think about it. Um, so I'll start by giving a, a quick introduction to who we are. Um, Hi, we're Exobotics. Uh, we've got offices in Cambridge and offices in Cornwall. Uh, we specialize in small satellites and robotics. And we were started uh, just over two years ago when we won a contract to uh, deliver a lunar rover on a former PTS, um, then PT scientist mission using your lunar, lunar lander. Um, and unfortunately, that didn't go very far because PT scientists went bankrupt. Um, uh, so we were left with a lunar lander and lots of cool tech and uh, no customers. So we've started doing what we do today, which is that we are developing sort of a whole suite platform. And I'll come on to that in a second. And um, But first, um, I think I ought to explain why is space important? Why are we doing this now? And um, so this is the market slide. And I'm told by the business people that this translates into why we're doing things. Uh, so I won't pretend to understand these numbers, but um, the version of space that you all know is government funded space. Yes, yeah, so that's Neil Armstrong, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Um, and then you probably also are aware of the satellite market. Um, so the mobile phone you're using now while pretending to listen to me um, uh, is working through a satellite. And there's been a big move in that field away from larger satellites towards smaller stuff. Um, and we'll come back to that and why that's important in a bit. Uh, the other one you're probably aware of is the robotics market. Um, so this is things like the current Mars lander, Perseverance, or the, uh, the helicopter that flew, I mean, was it yesterday for the first time, called Ing Ingenuity, which is pretty cool, helicopter on Mars. And then the one that's been in the news a lot with things like SpaceX, but it's the one that's still growing massively, is commercially funded. Um, and there's lots of technical reasons for why commercially funded exploration is finally taking off. But basically, is it's finally, the costs have finally come down to the area where companies can finally do it for themselves as opposed to relying on government funding. Um, so where does Exobotics fit into this? Well, our vision is that we want to lower the barriers to entry in terms of cost, skill, and time required to explore space. And we've kind of picked the moon as our target. And there's reasons for this. Uh, a, there's a big drive at the moment towards going back to the moon. Uh, and there's due to be, I think, five landers, potentially. Um, are aiming to land on the moon in the next five years from five different companies. Um, and our approach for this is, I guess, an end-to-end -end full stack platform, um, buzzwords over. So we're doing end-to-end -end roving services. So the idea is that you, if you potential customer approaches us and say, we want to put, I don't know, a thing of orange juice on the moon, you can come and talk to us and we'll work you through the entire process of how you would get that or introduce all your Tamagotchi into space. And then once your Tamagotchi is in space, we can walk it around and we can show you what's going on. Um, and we can communicate with it. We'll, we'll handle data transfer, we'll handle logistics, and all you'll have to do is provide us with the item. Um, and then to do that, we have a roving platform, which we'll come to in a second, and that's built on top of our custom products. So the way this works out is a sharp edge, as uh, so we have our end-to-end -end roving services. So that's um what we've mentioned. And so that's this. Um, I don't need, 
Bumpf isn't ex exceptionally interested in, but this is our XOB RV. So it's a foldable system um, and it drives around on the moon and it comes in a, a wide range of sizes and shapes um, and it's tailored to your seats. You could buy one of these off the shelf if you wanted. Um, um, but our primary aim is that this is this is our platform and instead you buy a slot on it. And then unsupporting that is our, yeah, the roving platform itself. So that's another view of it here, um, our foldable roving platform. And the idea is here, so you can't see fully from this model, but the wheels stow in the top, the controllers in the bottom, and in the middle slices for cargo. And with the end goal being exchanging $1 billion missions for hundreds of $1 million missions. And I've got some stats here that are interesting. So when I first started looking at space stuff a couple of years ago, because I was the only person in our co-founder team who doesn't have a background in space, I'm the software guy, um, is that the cost per kilo roughly of putting an object into space at the moment is about a hundred thousand pounds per kilo into low earth orbits that's where small satellites are and it's not that different for higher orbits the cost to put something in orbit around the moon is about one million pounds per kilo so that's 10 times as much roughly and the cost to put something on the moon itself is about two million pounds a kilo so that's doubled again and then the cost to put something on a rover on the moon is about three to five million pounds per kilo. So that's doubled again. So it's like 40 to 50 times as expensive as putting the equivalent object into orbit. Um, and so obviously our aim as Exobotics is to lower this cost and also to lower the, the weight and mass. And there's a lot of unique engineering challenges that are important for the moon, like radiation hardening and weight and strength of materials that aren't a major issue in satellites. So there's also a lot of engineering challenges to solve. Um, and if you want more details on this, I can more than happy to answer questions later. And then, but the thing underlying this is, is built on those engineering challenges I mentioned earlier, is that in low Earth orbit, weight isn't the primary concern and you're not particularly worried about radiation. There's other things you're concerned about. Whereas on the moon, data, data comms, um, uh, radiation hardening and all that stuff is very, very critical. And it means that while you can buy stuff off the shelf for um, low Earth orbit, you need equivalent versions of that for many things for the moon that don't exist and require very different underlying technologies. So that's the stage we're at at the moment. And that's what we're working on with Spaceport Cornwall. Um, so this is our um, current project. This is our X, XOVAC desktop thermal vacuum chamber, which translates to it's a vacuum oven. It goes very cold, it goes very hot, and it does it at vacuum. So you can put your satellite or something in here and you can test it as it would be in space. Um, and currently these systems are incredibly expensive to buy and we're hoping to sell this to you for a very for a small fraction of the cost. Um, and then these, there's a couple of the other projects coming up. We've got some atten attendance projects and structures. And this is being funded by Spaceport Cornwall, or it's partially funded. And uh, so that's why we're here today. And obviously we're very grateful for their help with that. Um, and the aim is eventually to have a full platform of all the bits you'd need if you wanted to build your own satellite for use in on the moon or around the moon as opposed to say use on or around the earth. And the buzzword there is lunar enabled. Um, I'll, I'll see myself out. Um, we'll come back to that in a sec. And this hot off the press, I believe this is the first time this has ever been shown outside of Exobotics is our current X. It's not fully wired in in this picture. This is a bit of an older picture. It's currently going for acceptance testing. Um, yours truly gets to write off a control code. Um, but yeah, this is our system and you can go and physically touch it and play with it um, provided you're in a clean room environment um, and so and I thought I'd just bring out a few of the more software-y side of things that Exobotics is interested in because there's a quite a big divide in space companies between what's known as old space and what's known as new space old space is typically companies that have been around for a long time or have worked closely with ESA and NASA for a long time and then there's the I guess a new startup model moving in and uh, um, a lot of the things that have been done in space were done a long time ago because a lot of qualifications, basically, if something goes wrong, it's incredibly expensive. Um, it's built around flight heritage and has it flown before. Like possibly one of the best, um, the best um, systems for say a satellite operation with radiation hardening is was originally designed in the 90s. Um, but as sort of as a commercial move back towards space, we need more dynamic, more modern manufacturing approaches brought in, and that's where Exobotics comes in. So we have three kind of core goals. And the first one is customization of standard. Um, is everything you buy from us 
will be will come in a variety of configurations um, and you'll be able to use our uh, novel generative web design web interface um, to design it to your needs and then it will be built on demand in our factories well the manufacturing center we're setting up which will be in Cornwall um, and that's using our experience in sort of modern engineering because that's our backgrounds um, and the second one is testing as standard so currently if you buy a cotsing off the shelf um, you'll get a history of the flights it's been on whether it's worked but your individual component won't have been tested whereas our idea is that every time you get a thing made it will be fully tested for you in our system um, and again, this is like as part of sort of modern manufacturing is you should have models, um, things like digital twinning. So you have a full digital model of the system and you can fully test it before it ever even gets made. And then you can then run it through the physical equivalent of those tests and then send it out. Um, and then the final thing is decentralization is that, um, this is what I mentioned earlier, is that large scale projects are coming to an end. Um, instead, um, governments and commercial entities and everyone is much more interested in using smaller or networks of smaller craft and that's where um, we come in is that the idea is instead of paying for one 300 kilo rover why wouldn't you pay for 21 kilo rovers and then save the cost of the jet fuel for the other 280 and have a much more versatile system um, so we've got these asynchronous networks of um, rover designs and the idea is that you could send a fleet of these to the moon they'll know where they are and they'll be able to communicate with um, local well, direct communication and they'll be able to position themselves without needing gps because there's no gps on the moon and things and you'll be able to yeah do what a bigger rover would take a week to do you'll be able to do in six hours with 20 smaller things and it'll still be much cheaper and to do this we're building on top of popular cubesat framework um but basically, yeah, that's kind of our, so those three things between them, customization standard, i.e. everything we make will be customized for you. Uh, testing standard, everything you make will have been tested both before and after manufacture. And decentralization, everything we make is targeting towards operation um, on scale with swarms as opposed to um, one-offs. Um, and I believe that's my time. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Please make them as technical as possible because I'm not very good at the business questions. So. Well, that was a brilliant talk. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm sure everyone at home is joining me and giving you a round of applause. If not, I hope they should be. Um, I have a question for you myself. Old space and new space. Do you ever have Royal Rumble style battles to see who should be the predominant force going forward? Um, I'm not aware of any um, Space Hunger games, but I feel it's probably like Fight Club. It's probably pretty underground, so maybe I just haven't been inducted into the right societies yet. Either that or you're just not allowed to talk about it and you're keeping it a secret. Yes, second rule. <laughs> um, um, yes. No, there's obviously there's a lot of collaboration. It's much more about approach. Um, Old Space was like, very closely tied to government, so there's much bit more, larger projects spanning many, many years. Um, whereas obviously new space, you're taking on much smaller, more discrete projects, but you've also got much tighter time limits. Excellent. Um, we've had a question come in from Paul Clark. Um, yes. What are the main end user deliverables to take to the moon? Uh, is by that you asking what sort of payloads would we be taking? I'm assuming that's the question. And um, that's kind of how I interpret it. Yeah. yeah. Um, that is a good question. Um, obviously, a lot of them are confidential. Um, uh, I actually have a spare slide on this. Um, so we basically have six basic areas of where we're, we're expecting customers. Um, and there's actually a seventh, which is currently the big one is at the moment, PR is the main thing. All, all the, the, yeah, the, the, the big uh, commercial investments into this all PR. Audi wants to send something, a car rover to the moon, BMW wants to send a rover to the moon. Um, uh, longer term, we're interested in exploration and mapping and monitoring. So these things are really important. It's actually the level of knowledge we have about the moon is very limited. Yeah. It's not like we have an ordnance survey map of the moon. All we have is a satellite pictures from space and that doesn't pick up things like where are their rocks or where are their minerals or where are their caves. Um, and then there's also longer term, there's inspection. So if other people have things up there, you want to be able to it. It's actually very difficult to look at the outside of a um, a rover. I mean, that's one of the reasons why uh, rovers are so expensive, like particularly the Mars ones, is they have really long arms. And the reason they have really long arms is they can turn a camera back on themselves. Um, 
And then the long, longest term still, we're interested in resource acquisition and asset management and things. Uh, primarily, I mean, the, the long term dream, the, the, uh, the trillion dollar pie that everyone's playing for a part of, but is never going to be seen in the next 20 years is things like space mining. Well, fingers crossed for space mining. Um, that would be got, cool. It would be really, really cool. Um, we've got one question coming, but we've only got one minute to answer it, so it'll have to be Fair a enough. quick one. Do you have any policies on space waste, and how do you plan to handle it? And that's coming from Thomas. That's that's a, that's actually a good question. So uh, my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, so treat what I say with a pinch of salt, is that there's very tightly controlled rules on everything from the Mars outwards. However, the rules on the moon are a bit sketchy because they were set up before people primarily became an issue. Uh, we, however, intend to follow all the standard NASA setup, um, which is very rigorous. Um, among which, one of the things is you're not allowed to go anywhere near the uh, existing Apollo sites. Okay. That's interesting. It's interesting that you're not allowed to go near it. Is that because they're worried you'll steal their secrets or something? Um, uh, yeah, well, you just, 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 just yeah, they realise that it's only but it's only balloons, and the real thing was a fake or something. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking, but um, yeah. So if you if you're writing the next space novel set up around the old um, yeah, so, so on Apollo site, where well, you're not allowed within I think ten kilometres of it at the moment. So um, now we know, folks. Peter, once again, thank you very much for that amazing talk. Um, I believe you're going to be hanging around for a little bit longer, so yeah, yeah. people can link up with you in the chat if they want to. And I think somebody dropped your email address in the chat as well a little bit earlier. Ah, so everyone cool. watching along, your next session is with is from Data Duopoly with Tanuvi, and that is going to be starting any second now. So head over to the sessions and join that one now. Peter, once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much.